Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Colin from Legend of Portal Cast. And this is Marilyn from Beyond Bending Podcast. So we are uh, doing a joint venture. We have talked about doing something like this. This is a collaboration between our two podcasts called Beyond or yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great start to it. It's called <laughs> it's called Beyond Portalcast. And this is just a little mini series that we're gonna be doing all about the rise of Kyoshi, the most recent Avatar novel that just came out. Yes. So Colin and I have decided to join forces because honestly, like we both bought the book and as we were reading it, we kept texting each other like, oh my God, Colin. <laughs> Colin, and then it got to the point where I was texting in all caps, like, Colin! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It was such a crazy stretch because I was just, like, buried in that book. And it was it was when, like, the heat wave was happening here on the East Coast. And I just was like, all I want to do is stay inside with the air conditioning and just read this book all day. And that was pretty much what I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we, we talked about it and after kind of freaking out about it and we're still freaking out about it, we wanted to do a chapter by chapter review of this book because holy shit, there's so much to unpack with this. It's insane. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember, oh gosh, Colin, I don't read. Like I honestly, <laughs> everyone's going to hate me, but I'm behind on the Avatar comics like I haven't read any. That's how no. behind I am. I know. Heretic. I'm working on it. <laughs> no. I know. <laughs> but uh, Avatar The Last Airbender barely touches on her. And I already knew. I'm sorry, Aang, but she's my favorite Avatar. And <laughs> so when they announced this book, The Rise of Kyoshi, I immediately pre-ordered it on Amazon. Amazon was really on top of it. Like they sent it like a day early. So when it released, it was on my front porch. And so I got it and I was like, oh my God, I totally forgot. So I started like reading it and it was just a roller coaster of emotions. Like I haven't felt this way in a long time reading a book. And then by the time I finished, I, like, I think I was trying to race you, Colin. Cause you, <laughs> <laughs> like, I texted you and I was like, oh, I'm on chapter three. And you were like, oh, I didn't even start yet. And then the next day you're like, oh, I'm halfway. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? Are you kidding me right now? And so I think I, like, paused my whole life just to finish this book so that we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so glad that you did because as soon as I finished, I was like, oh my God, there's like no one else who has finished reading this. And I was like, I have no yeah. one to talk to about it. I'm going to burst. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's when I sent you like five gifs of how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So for those uh, of you who haven't read the book, this mini series is, I mean, it's going to have everything. So if you have not read the book and you don't want to have it spoiled, go read the book and then come back. But if you don't <laughs> care, then come along with us on this journey uh, because we're going to go chapter by chapter talking about everything that's going to be happening. Just because again, this is, oh, it's so insane. This is the fact that we have an Avatar novel is still blowing my mind. I went into this book with such, to be honest, low expectations. I was like, all right, I'm excited that this is happening. This is cool. But I was like very cautiously optimistic about it. And when I read through it, I'm like, this is insane. This is groundbreaking for the fandom and for this universe. Like this is so unique and this is just so revitalizing. And I am just so excited to talk about it. <laughs> 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 yeah so warning if you haven't read the rise of kiyoshi what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna go chapter by chapter as if you read it with us so full-on spoilers if you have not read this book and you are listening to these episodes you will be so lost and <laughs> i don't know how to help you except go buy the fucking book like <laughs> for a person that never reads this book is so worth it Trust me, like if it was able to keep me captivated and make me fall in love with Avatar all over again, it's going to do the same for you. So I highly, this book is not sponsored by us, but it should be. Um. <laughs> <laughs> FCE, if you are listening, yo, uh, well, we already have the books. So I mean, just like, yeah, 
Go you. <laughs> <laughs> so the book starts off with a letter from Michael DiMartino. Right off the bat, he tells us that doing any prequel in general is hard, but done well, a prequel can expand and deepen the love we have for this world that he helped create. So we got introduced to Kiyoshi in Avatar The Last Airbender, and we know her legacy, but how did she get there? How did she become this powerful feminist icon that we know today? There are so many questions that FCE, the author, needs to explore, and Michael DiMartino sure as hell brought them up <laughs> when he consulted him. <laughs> he tells us in this letter what he told him, and he just starts listing off a bunch of must-haves, like there needs to be the Avatar, like the Avatar has to bend all four elements, the Avatar needs to have friends and companions, there needs to be political conflict, and most importantly, there needs to be epic bending battles. And he also informs us that he was really anxious letting someone write a prequel for Avatar Kiyoshi. I mean, like, it's his fucking baby. <laughs> I'm sure anyone can understand. But after reading The Rise of Kiyoshi for the first time, he was immediately sucked back into the story and found himself invested in the new characters and backstories that FCE created. He tells us that it was a pleasure working with everyone on this project and that he's excited to have this book be canon in the Avatar universe. Ooh. Hell yes. Uh, I mean, it's worth to note, too, that, um, you know, during the time in between Legend of Korra and now, uh, Michael DiMartino has actually started a young adult novel series uh, called the Rebel Genius series. He came out with two books so far. The first one is Rebel Genius. And the second book is called Warrior Genius. What's great about the fact that, you know, especially noting in this forward and Michael DiMartino's kind of guidance for FCE was not only for like the Avatar world, but, you know, being able to have someone who also is also entrenched in the young adult novel world. Uh, FCE uh, has also been in that realm as well. So it was cool to like, I think anytime that you work with someone who is also working on the same types of stuff, like you can have a shared language in a better way. So I'm sure it made like collaboration and communication for them like really awesome. And ah, gosh, just, I mean, and it's a huge undertaking. Like, I mean, you think about it, it's like, this is the first Avatar novel. And it's one of those things where it's like, if you fuck this up, then we're probably not gonna have any more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and oh my gosh, does FCE deliver? <laughs> All right, so Marilyn, let's kick us off. Let's let's start. I'm I'm so ready. Oh, also, you can't do this to me. I'm so excited to start talking about this. I'm sorry, no, because it's it's in book format, and so I have to. I feel like we have to address all of this in a different way than how we usually do it, because we're used to analyzing. Well, I guess well, you have tackled in analyzing the graphic novels, but in books, usually there's like a table of contents, right? Like all the it depends. I mean, that that was interesting, I noticed, but sometimes uh, authors leave out table of contents because uh, sometimes chapter names can like give away the plot. Right. And everything, which I think that was the case for this, because I think certain chapter names would have definitely given away like certain story beats. Okay. Yeah. So the first chapter, chapter one is called The Test. And what do you know? <laughs> it gives it away. <laughs> so we get introduced to a small town called Yokoya. Jianzu, the first character we meet, observes Yokoya for the first time with us as he rides through the city, or it's more of a town. He tells us that the town could have been prosperous, but fate did not wield it so. Even though the town is on the coast and on the way to Amashu, every ship sails past it because the winds are too good to pass up and there's more of a convenient place to stop. The soil on Yokoya is not that great, and the farmers count their lucky stars if they can even grow anything. Even though the town is located in between the earth, air, and water nations, no one really cares enough to conquer it, <laughs> which is perfect for Jianzu and his friend Kelsang because they are planning on doing a little experiment there. Ah, it's such a good like groundwork laying the setting and like, you know, I, 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 as soon as they started saying like, oh, it's on its way to a mushroom, I'm like, this is on a page right now. I'm freaking out that like they're talking about this world that I know and love so well. <laughs> <laughs> so Jianzu is riding through the town and he passes by like this random bare log 
that shoots up in the sky and it's in the middle of the courtyard. He tells us that the log is probably meant to be the spiritual center of the village, but nothing is carved out. He reaches a hall and steps inside and sees rows of toys just laid out on the floor. Avatar alert! <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 1, The Test. Hmm. <laughs> His friend Kelsang, an airbender monk, has been meticulously laying out thousands of toys on the floor. Jianzu thought one of the toys was out of place and earthbended it more towards the middle, but Kelsang ended up putting it back where it was. And it is in this moment that we find out that Jianzu is an earthbender. Yes. Through some expositional dialogue, we find out that Jianzu convinced Lu Beifong to let him do the air nomad test in the earth cycle, and that Kelsang took the relics from the monks without asking them. All of this just reminded Jianzu of how Avatar Kuruk would always tell him that it's better to ask for forgiveness later than for permission. Jianzu tells us that Kurok died at the age of 33 and that it's been seven years since and they still haven't found the next avatar. And people are starting to freak out <laughs> because it's <laughs> never taken this long before. Some people think that the avatar cycle is broken because of how unpure and secular the world has become. And they've tried to keep the absence of the avatar a secret, but evil and corrupt people have picked up on this and have started to rise and gain power. <sighs> There's so much to unpack, even just in like <laughs> this part here. I mean, first off, that log in the middle of the village. Clearly, I'm assuming that Yokoya is what is now known, I think, as Kiyoshi Island. Colin, it took me too long to figure this out. I felt so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> this is why I don't read books. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's amazing because we're already seeing that, like, you know, painting the picture of this town that is very not great for crops, but it's this amazing mix of like, it's not an ideal town, but that also kind of keeps it out of the way. And I love that he kind of brings up those details. And then freaking name dropping a Beifong. Of course, the Beifongs are a family that have been <laughs> around for generations. But still, when that name first shows up, you're like, oh my God, crinkle tinkles down my spine right now. I am so excited to like see this. And then this revelation in this choice to have Kurik die at such a young age is insane to me. That was such a surprise when I first read that. Yeah, it's, um, did they talk about it in the show? He died early, right? Or was it like after the show ended when people started looking into like the lore? I, I really do not remember them ever saying that he died early because I don't know if we were ever given like a specific timeline. I think we had a timeline with Roku past Kyoshi. But I don't think anyone knew like how long Kurok had lived. And if that is not the case, if there is there, I would love to know like where that is. But like that always flew under my radar. And I was like, holy crap, here is a self-indulgent avatar who clearly it seems died from his vices, which is already setting like such an interesting and dark tone compared to how the rest of Avatar is usually told in a story form, which is ugh, just insane to me. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not there yet, Colin. I know. I'm sorry. Yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to curtail myself. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it contained. Keep it contained. <laughs> I like what you said about the crops just being shitty. Like, Yokoya could be the best city. Like, there's potential there. And I like how, in a way, it reflects Kiyoshi. Like, mm. there's potential there. You just have to invest in it. And, ooh, ooh, chills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The town really is like a metaphor for Kiyoshi throughout the story. And oh man, I love too that we get to see, uh, you know, Kelsang and we get to see the familiar airbending avatar test, you know, with all of the toys, because that was such a great flashback during the storm of when Aang, you know, was presented with the toys when he was like 12 and they're like, hey, do you know what these are? He's like, oh, I love these. They're like, well, you chose them out of thousands. And <laughs> that makes you the avatar, which is just crazy because it's this like such a long standing tradition. But you think about how like how they would have to determine who the avatar is. And like the Earth Kingdom is it's fucking massive. Like it is so huge. And this is before there were any like rail lines 
or any means of like really fast transportation besides sky bison, like just information moving across. I I don't know. It's like, it sounds like a logistical nightmare. (laughs) Also, uh, I didn't put it in the recap, but Jansu is very, what's the word I'm looking for? He's very observant Mm. in every place that he's in. He like hyper analyzes everything and we get deeper into that when he's interacting with people. This dude is, even though he's Earth Kingdom, he's very Fire Nation like Azula where everything that he does is like a chess move. And Mm. oh my God. Ugh. Ugh. I mean, I definitely I definitely agree that like he's always trying to play like five steps ahead. But what I also love and we see this like characterized through him throughout the entire book. And what's great is that this book isn't limited to a singular perspective. It's not just told from Kiyoshi's perspective. And when we have these scenes in the book with Jianzu, like it is from his perspective. And we get that from the way that they're writing. And again, like you said, his observations but so much of his essential being always comes back to this idea of neutral Jing. And he always is like coming back of like, let's just wait and listen and see what happens. But even though he's waiting and listening, he is still like planning out his moves in the meantime, <laughs> because he's like, I will wait and listen. But at the same time, I've got like 10,000 contingencies ready to like address all of these situations. <laughs> <laughs> We kind of get like a description of how Jianzu and Kelsing look. And I don't know if like, I assume every middle-aged man has a really long beard, but (laughs) I'm trying to picture it. And I have yet to see an Asian man with like a full long beard. Usually it's just like Asian whiskers. (laughs) Like when I was reading this book, I just pictured them cartoon version. Because I don't know. Like, well, that, that's the crazy part about like this now. It's like every single character we have ever been privy to in this show has always had visual representation. And with this yeah. book, besides Kiyoshi, and that's really only besides Kiyoshi in her war paint and like in her final form, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, everyone else, it's all based on only the descriptions. And you're kind of forming those images in your head. But again, we are so informed by the style of the show that I was doing the same thing, Marilyn. I was like imagining (laughs) so much of it in that style of animation, which was so cool. I remember like I like freaked out when I was going through uh, Instagram and Keikachi95, this artist on Instagram, had done a rendering of Kyoshi and Rangi, who we'll be talking about later. And I like freaked out because I was like, oh my God, it's a visual representation of these characters. I like furiously sent it to you. I'm like, look at this. When you sent that to me, I hella freaked out. All right. So let's continue into this chapter or else I'm going to spiral out of control. I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one more thing. I like how Jianzu brings up how there's like speculation that the cycle is broken. And he kind of plays into it too because he is as frustrated like, if not the most frustrated out of everyone, because he's the one actively trying to search for the Avatar. And he, like, he starts listing off a bunch of things, like the Earth Kingdom blames the Fire Nation, the Fire Nation blames Air Nomads for not being active in politics. Everyone's, like, pointing the finger at all the nations, and it's like, it's your fault that, like, our Jesus isn't here. Like, you guys (laughs) suck. And Jianzu, he's kind of fed up with this, but I feel like part of him believes in that because it's like, poor guy. He just, he goes through a lot, even before arriving at Yokoya, like. And there's still so much we don't even know. Even with what this book like shows, there is still so much we don't know about how Kurik's life ended and what happened towards the end there. So I feel like that's going to be explored a little bit later, but you're right. He has this like very unique perspective on the world because he has obviously been this worldly traveler. He's engaged in politics and he is like this amazing vehicle to kind of see and like have a pulse on the world as they are going through this transition period. But yeah, let's continue. (laughs) (laughs) For the Earth Cycle, it's tradition to use geomancy to find the avatar. But 
But after many failed attempts, and like the book just starts listing off a bunch of people, even Lu Bei Fong tried doing geomancy, but no one really succeeded. So Jianzu and Kelsing decided to break tradition and to try this cycle with the air nomad test. And the test is simple enough. Out of thousands of toys, the child has to choose the right four toys that belonged to the past avatars. But the test seems to be more trouble than it's worth because... <laughs> <laughs> So they get all the kids in Yokoya and they're like, hey, like we have a test for you. They don't even say it. They're like, because these seven-year-old kids, they're like, hey, you can pick four toys. And they're like all excited about it. And once they grab the four toys, they're all wrong. And so they take the toys back. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Jianzu is like, okay, when this was done in like Air Nomad tradition, Air Nomad kids like may be disappointed, but usually they're chill as hell because, you know, no earthly attachments. But like Earth Kingdom kids are like, fuck no, give me my toy back. <laughs> you can't just like <laughs> give me this toy and be like, nah, never mind. <laughs> they're so fucking bitter about it too. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's not just the children that are upset. The parents are fucking pissed <laughs> off as well. Like one, they now have to deal with a screaming, crying child. And two, they're like super disappointed that their child wasn't the chosen one. <laughs> it got to the point where Jianzu and Kelsey couldn't even walk down the street because everyone was giving them the death stare. But can you imagine <laughs> that though? Like in a world today where like the Christian church would be like, all right, guys, uh, Jesus is going to come back around. We just got to do a test to see which one of your kids is Jesus. Can you imagine, like, all of the people would be like, nah, man, my kid is Jesus. Nah, man, my kid is Jesus. <laughs> Just, like, <laughs> the rage and fury that would ensue because everyone would want to have that status and, oh, God. <laughs> it's a recipe for chaos. Yeah. <laughs> we cut to one of the kids being tested. And I, when I was recapping this, I was like, this book has cuts, Colin. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It does. After a paragraph, there would be like a paint stroke and mm -hmm. it would go to another paragraph. And I just thought that was so cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, like from a writing standpoint, to have those jumps in time, again, it's like it gives you that freedom to be able to, you can move the story to a different place in time much more easily, I think, in a novel than you sometimes can in a show or even sometimes in a graphic novel. I think the, the graphic novel is the middle ground, but like a novel, especially the reader is much more likely to be able to say like, okay, cool. I'm still following along with this as long as I have context, because it's not as much of a shock visually for them to be like, okay, well, how much time passed? But like having that indicator on the page is like a great way to be able to say like, okay, this is a different part here. It's not just like the next part of this. Yeah, and I, I love how FCE plays with that too, just like when to cut. Other than his way of pacing and laying out all of the plots and the character development, but as a book medium, there's very limited things you can do. And so I like how he uses like the brushstroke to signify that. So we cut to a scene of one of the kids being tested. The dad is demanding them to pay him a fee to test his daughter. <laughs> and Giano gets pissed. He starts arguing with the dad. And Kelsey notices that his daughter had picked up the whirly gig and is already eyeing the drum. That's two out of four, correct? Gianza sees this and shuts up and gives the dad the money. <laughs> Both of them are just so excited. Now the girl is picking up the hog monkey and Kelsey is about to explode because that's three out of four and this is like the best luck they've ever had for seven years. All of a sudden, this girl just starts stomping on the hog monkey and screams, <laughs> Die! <laughs> <laughs> and the dad chooses this moment to ask Jianzu for more money. <laughs> Kelsing's about to cry, and Jianzu is so fucking pissed, he yells at them to get out. As they are leaving the room, they run past a girl that's watching from the outside. And um, this is when Jianzu tells us that he admits that he overlooked her because she seemed much older than the other kids because of how big she was. 
As they approach her, they notice how underfed and poorly dressed she is and gather that she's probably an orphan. Kelsey goes up to her and asks her what her name is and she whispers, Kyoshi. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the monk brings her inside and tries to sweet talk to her because she's so scared. Oh my god, poor little oh. Kyoshi. She's oh. so scared. <laughs> Kelsey's like, come on, you can grab a toy. You're allowed four toys. And Kiyoshi just like can't believe it. Like she's not breaking eye contact with Kelsang. But after a bit, she just runs to the toys. And guess what toy she grabs? <laughs> Hell yeah. Out of thousands of toys, she grabs the clay turtle. And then Kelsang tells us that no kid even like paid attention to that clay turtle at all because it just looked like a crappy ass toy <laughs> but kiyoshi was the first toy she grabs and kelsey is just livid oh my god yeah well i, I want to just touch on that moment too with her being so timid and everything it's like it is such a great character identifier because they are already assessing that maybe she's an orphan we see physically that she's underfed and clearly she has like massive trust issues mm -hmm. like she is you know scared to accept this because like she is being shown kindness and for her to react so tentatively to it is such a clear indicator that she's been burned by lots of other people before and it's just like really painting this picture of a character i just loved it that fc just wasted no time to get that going for us so she goes back to Kelsang and she's like holding on to this clay turtle for dear life. And Kelsang is like, okay, you can choose three more toys. And like what you said, Kiyoshi has severe trust issues. She shakes her head and just like is in denial that she can have three more toys. Before Kelsang can even say anything, she just starts booking it. And she <laughs> runs out of the building and disappears into town. We cut to Jianzu having flashbacks. He's somewhere in a village deep in the Earth Kingdom that's just been liberated by Su Ping An and the Renex. His clothes <laughs> The <smell> Yellow Nex. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> Alright, maybe we're gonna be able to go we're gonna liberate this town, we're gonna go over there. Alright, Su Ping An, let's do this. Okay, let me start that over. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm cool moving forward. That was fine. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, everyone, they're called the Yellow Necks, okay? <laughs> so the village that he's in has just been liberated by Su Ping An and the Yellow Necks. His clothes smell like rotting flesh. And next to him is a messenger from the Earth Kingdom telling him that reinforcements are not coming. We flash forward a bit and Jianzu is now sitting across an ice table and looking at Tuwok, Lord of the Fifth Nation Pirates. Tuwok is coughing up blood all over the accords that's been signed by Avatar Yang Shin that basically forbids him and the pirates from raiding the southern coastlines. His daughter slash lieutenant is right by his side, giving Jianzu the death stare. I love how he confides in us as the readers, mm -hmm. and maybe he's like talking to himself, but it's just so good. He tells us that he should be by the Avatar side throughout this whole thing, but he's alone instead trying to save the world. Kelsang snaps him out of it and tries to cheer him up. And I assume he had these flashbacks right after Kiyoshi took off with a clay turtle. <laughs> and he's like, oh, come on, man. It's not like you lost a thousand-year-old toy to a child. <laughs> 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 this kind of cheers up Jianzu, and he tells us, the readers, how he really loves Kelsang's sense of humor. Yes. And it, like, really contrasts with his very stoic, stark nature. But things get serious again, and he tells Kelsang that they have to go after her to retrieve the toy. And Kelsang says that he doesn't want to take the toy away from a child. And Jianz is like, really? <laughs> You're willing to destroy the air nomad test for like eternity for the sake of a child's happiness? And Kelsang responds with, it'll find its way back to where it belongs eventually. <laughs> oh, such an air nomad response. I love it. <laughs> uh, okay, there's so much to unpack in this last part here. First and foremost, the fact that we're getting these flashbacks it's already showing us that like this is such a darker tone they're talking about like 
specifically using the language. His clothes smell like rotting flesh. That is not the language or the tone that has ever really been in any kind of Avatar story. And that is what the tone is being set like from the get go. It's just already it's like this is so unique. Reading this for the first time was like experiencing this world in such a different light. And I love that FCE starts right away with setting that tone. The second thing that I was freaking out about, we have a fucking thing about the Fifth Nation pirates. This whole idea of like the pirates trying to be this whole nother nation on top of like the rest of the world is just insane to me. And the fact that they were like creating such a a movement and organized in such a way, it makes me think of like, you know, we see the remnants of pirates in Avatar The Last Airbender, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know. I I just was like, where's my bejeweled monkey? Because we have a <laughs> we have a running theory on our show that that is like the crux of the we made a joke that there's like a pirate underworld connection and it's all tied into the bejeweled monkey. And we we're making this in complete jest. So when I read this for the first time, I was like, holy fucking shit. This is where the bejeweled monkey is. <laughs> It was just, it was mildly vindicating. <laughs> <laughs> okay, honestly, when I read this whole section in the book, I didn't process any of it. And I think this is what FCE wants us to do. He wants us to reread the book. And like J.K. Rowling, she trickles a bunch of clues throughout her book mm. that she brings up again in the last book. And it's like, a, I gotcha. <laughs> You weren't paying attention. Now you're paying attention. And I feel like FCE does that here where he, oh my God, there's so many things. He talks about Su Ping An and the yellow necks. He talks about his clothes smelling like rotting flesh and him when Jian Zhu buried those 5,000 bodies. Mm -hmm. And to top it off, just like the Earth Kingdom not sending any reinforcements and him feeling isolated and alone that he has to basically save the world by himself without the Avatar. Like, his friend fucked up. Like, his best friend, Avatar Kurok, fucked up, left him alone. And you see this again when he's sitting across the table with the Fifth Nation pirates, and we get a name that I don't think is ever mentioned again in the book. Tulok, the Fifth Nation pirate queen. It's uh, Tagaka. Tagaka. So in this scene, Tagaka is right next to her father that she talks so much about. Like, I am not as good as a waterbender as my dad. And you see him here. And oh my gosh, there's so much seed planting. It's so good. Yeah. And then also, uh, there's the idea of this is something that I'm going to want to touch on, like over the course of this miniseries, is that this book follows the very classic model of the hero's journey. And there are certain tropes that always kind of occur in this type of story structure. And one of them is what's known as like the artifact. And this is a particular item that holds a special significance to the hero. And sometimes they lose the artifact or sometimes the artifact returns to them in a moment where they are having a very powerful kind of change in their life. And the artifact in this case is the clay turtle. And the extremely powerful moment that Kiyoshi has towards the end of the book with this, as we'll get into it, is just like it is with her the entire time and what that comes to represent and how it's been the groundwork has been laid at the beginning of this and how that's going to play into the end. There, There's just so much amazing foundation just being laid in this first chapter. Again, you're seeing all of this being prepared for a massive, beautifully woven tapestry of a story. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited to get into it because honestly, I think I forgot how the clay turtle came in at the end. Maybe I was just reading so fast I wanted to know (laughs) what happened. (laughs) So yeah, uh, well, I guess that concludes uh, kind of- No, it doesn't. No, (laughs) I want to talk way more. (laughs) I know. I know. Well, we have to keep it as many sods. I mean, the thing is, we'll be able to dive in like even more and more. I have a feeling so much of the conversations that we're going to have over the course of these mini sods, they're just going to stack on top of each other because yeah. there are so many layers being added in to everything. But I mean, of course, this chapter is called the test. We got to see the classic avatar test. 
uh, <laughs> that we were familiar with and we were introduced to Kyoshi. But more importantly, we are seeing this story in the beginning from the perspective of Jianzu. And his role in the story is massive. Again, it's we don't know what he becomes like from the beginning here, but laying the groundwork of this complex character who has had to go through a lot. As we see just in this moment, he has had a crazy past that we still don't know fully about. And to know that he's a central role in this story, it's just it's amazing that they're giving so much focus to him, which is not surprising because, again, that is what like the Avatar world is all about, is these complex characters who aren't just necessarily good and evil. There's so much in between and there's so much that causes people to either fall to corruption or, you know, fall to the dark side (laughs) and that kind of deal. (laughs) But, oh my God, I mean, it's just... This first chapter was great, and it was such a amazing start like to this novel. Yeah. One thing I did want to talk about before we um, conclude is that, did you understand the geomancy that Jianzu was trying to explain? Like, the Earth Kingdom test, they have their own test of how they find the Avatar? Yeah, I have, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Like, it seems like they had bones in front of them, and they put it on a map, and they tried to, like, Ouija board it or something (laughs) to find, like, an exact location of where the Avatar is located. And I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Which is, I mean, it's crazy, though, because you think about, like, how long the tradition of the Avatar has been going on in all of the superstitions and all of the traditions and how so much of that, especially for like each nation, how much time passes Mm. between each avatar that is associated with their nation. Because even if the avatar dies a very early death, I mean, you're looking at usually a minimum of like a hundred years, but a maximum of, you know, potentially like around 300 years. Yeah. Okay, so let's recap what happened in the first chapter. Yes. We get introduced to two characters, Jianzu and Kelsang. Jianzu tells us that it's been seven years and they still haven't found the Avatar. The Earth Kingdom Avatar test failed, so they have resulted in doing the Air Nomad test. Kelsang stole the toys from from the <laughs> Air Nomads and managed to lose a thousand-year-old artifact to Kiyoshi that is an orphan and underfed and has trust issues and took off with it. And the last thing we get is just like Kelsang trying not to freak out that he lost this toy. <laughs> <laughs> and some very dark and ominous flashbacks with uh, with Jianzu of yeah. like adding adding this like mysterious layer to, you know, who he is and what his past was, but clearly him and Kelsang having some connection to the past avatar. And we also get introduced to Yokoya too that is as much of a character as Jianzu and Kelsang. Like, mm, Yokoya mm-hmm. is and will be Kyoshi Island. And it's so... Just like the journey of Yokoya is as captivating as the journey of Kyoshi. Mm. And I just think that's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's like the cool part that we know, I mean, from the show, how Yokoya becomes Kyoshi Island. And it's from this moment of Avatar Kyoshi standing up to Chin the Conqueror and basically removing this like landmass from the continent to create an island. I mean, knowing that detail and knowing that that's in the future is like one of those things where we're like, whoa, we know where her power is going, but it's cool to see her now at the beginning of her journey where she is this like timid, afraid orphan child. Ah. <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's going to be a lot of us like just sighing and like throughout this entire miniseries. <laughs> oh my gosh. Would you be down every time a character dies, we take a shot? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> just to set the tone for everyone that's listening to this and haven't read the book, what are you doing? But also, since you are listening to us and you are able to drink and willing to drink, you should definitely take a shot with us. <laughs> but if you cannot drink, we do not encourage you to drink because, you know, responsibility. 
We will never <laughs> coerce you into drinking. It mm. is your own free will if you want to join us. And maybe you want to have some lychee juice or yeah. <laughs> maybe like, you know, down some tea. Cactus You know, juice. <laughs> maybe just make sure the tea isn't too hot because then, you know, you'll like scald your vocal cords and be like, fuck these podcast people. They burn <laughs> their throat. <laughs> Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> but, oh my gosh, no one died yet in this chapter, but... <laughs> yes. All right, well, I'm going to have to I'm gonna have to have have to something, like, prepared and ready. I mean, we start getting, like, to deaths, like, pretty soon into this, I feel like. I don't know. Mm. Like, I read through that book so fast, and already so much of it has already become a blur. I'm just surprised I remembered as much as I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All the feelings will come back once we recap every chapter. Yes. All right, cool. Again, uh, we are going to be going through all of these chapters. So be sure to stay tuned for this. Uh, follow along with us on this crazy journey as we kind of go and recap this book. Of course, I am Colin from Legend of Portalcast. Uh, you can check out our podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Legend of Portalcast. Our website is legendofportalcast.com. I'll let Marilyn tell you a little bit about Beyond Bending. Yeah, um, check out my podcast, Beyond Bending Podcast. You can find us on all social medias, um, beyondbending.com. For this mini-series, since I'm in mid-season one on my podcast, we're going to be releasing this mini-series over at Legend of Portalcast first. And then once I finish season one, I'm going to start dropping the mini-series content on my podcast. So stay tuned for that. Follow our tale. Join us on this journey. Take a shot whenever people die. <laughs> because you know what? We're in a new Avatar story where people do die. And it's not a uncertain like, well, did they? Or, you know, in the case of Korra, like, okay, like one significant person is going to die. Like, nah, there's there's several gut punches in this book. And you guys just best be ready for them. I mean, if you've already read the book, you know. But like revisiting, opening those old wounds. Yeah, we talk about how analyzing this book as a medium it's very PG-13. Mm -hmm. It's crazy because the world of Avatar, I feel like, was limited to the standards of like Nickelodeon and their rating system and the comic books. And I don't know how dark it got in the comic books, but this book is a very PG-13, especially with introducing like our very queer character uh, <laughs> and her just liking a girl. It makes it automatically PG-13 because America sucks and <laughs> they need to change their rating system because it's super flawed. But yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> we, You know what? We're, we're making steps. You know, Korra and Asami <laughs> happened at the end of Legend of Korra. Steven Universe has been happening. You know, we're we're getting there. She-Rock. Yes. She-Rock too. Hell okay. yeah, she -Ra. I love that show. All right. Well, stay tuned for the next time we're going to be coming out with this. And yeah, for now, let us leave. Flame me out, hot stuff. <laughs> <laughs>